Well, good afternoon from uh, Paris Air Show 2019. A strangely empty area, if you like, of today's uh, show is the area where normally you would have lots of large commercial aircraft. So Jens, let's, uh, we can dig into this a little bit more. Why are we looking at a fairly empty commercial area, apart from, of course, Embraer's uh, E195E2, which is behind us? Well, I mean, there's uh, some you know, not so spectacular reasons for aircraft missing here and some pretty uh, serious reasons. Uh, of course, we know Boeing's priority is, of course, getting the 737 MAX back into the air following its grounding in mid-March after the, uh, the two accidents that the aircraft was involved with. There's a really interesting debate unfolding right now with regards to NMA, um, which is, you know, can Boeing actually afford to do NMA now that Max is so much in trouble? And shouldn't Boeing rather focus on uh, develop, developing a, a Max replacement, a new uh, you know, narrow body? The one thing that Boeing is saying for sure is they remain totally committed to the MAX, of course. And there's a very good reason for that, um, in that obviously it's, a, it's still in the middle of the family development. They've still got three versions which are now currently just about to uh, emerge into the market. And, of course, don't, look, don't forget to look at that order book. It's still pretty huge. 5,000. Huh? Yeah, if they didn't take another order, they would still be producing it for another seven years, basically. And that's at a high rate. So... You know, from from our perspective, looking at it, um, I think I agree. You know, sort of at least I can see what they're talking about in that regard. That they are going to be committed to to the program. In the meantime, of course, what are the options if the air, if the market is still building and growing like it is? You have to get in line with Airbus. It's the same at Boeing. So I think people are going to hold on to orders uh, because there there's just nowhere else to go right now. And if you want to go and buy an Airbus, you have to wait six years or seven years yes. to get uh, you know, a slot, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> of course, there are other developments here, Jens, aren't there? We're standing right in front of Embraer's uh, Profit Hunter, the E195E2. E2. Um, but of course, even here, uh, history is quickly changing in front of our eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember actually two years ago when we were here in Paris, the... Uh, it was kind of six months ahead of entry into service. And uh, I remember many conversations with Embraer executives uh, back then uh, saying that, yes, they want to break out of the regional segment with the uh, E2s, uh, particularly with the 195, which is a large aircraft, really, uh, go into mainline, go into LCCs, low-cost carriers, uh, go into hybrid carriers. There were big campaigns out there with JetBlue, uh, Moxie, and so on. Uh, and, you know, two years on, you have to say, sales must be disappointing to Embraer. Ma management is telling us that it is coming this year, there will be more orders. And of course, I mean, the big change is now, it's no, I mean, these aircraft may not may not uh, be named Embraer E2 very, for very much longer. Right. Could be something like Boeing whatever, if it, yeah. obviously after the uh, creation of the Boeing Brazil commercial joint venture with, uh, with Boeing. Yes, exactly, yeah. And we could be seeing certainly big changes, certainly even by Farnborough next year. But of course, this isn't the only other um, interesting change in the regional jet story. Um, Mitsubishi, of course, uh, done a major rebranding. So that airplane is just around the corner. So let's go and have a look at it. Over there. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, just as we went into the show, really, uh, Mitsubishi rebranded the uh, what was called the MRJ. It's now the space jet. There's an M90, which is the larger version, and there's an M M100, which is the smaller version. Yeah, the, of course, the, 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 this program, which was, as you quite rightly say, previously known as the MRJ-90, is getting pretty close now to finalizing its certification program and flight testing, again, as you said, in, in Moses Lake in northwestern U.S. But um, it is very interesting what they've done with the... Uh, it's more than a rebranding, I think, because obviously the, M, the MRJ-90, the M90 now, was effectively done. It's it's now all the way through, virtually through certification. But they still had an opportunity to do something kind of dramatically different with the MRJ-70, now known as the M100. Um, so the um, the idea was really that they they figured that the scope clause would, of course, be changed by the time the uh, 70 was in in business and production. But of course, it hasn't really changed at all. So they've reacted by changing the product. They've actually stretched the aircraft. They've made it, uh, it's only three feet or so, four feet actually shorter than this one. Even So it's confusingly called the M100, even though it's slightly smaller than this one, which is the 90. Um, but in doing so, it means that they can now 
basically be compliant with scope clause, and I think that's going to make a huge difference. With, with the original MRJ70 was kind of suboptimal for scope clauses because it was re really too small, and the, the yeah. MRJ90 was uh, too big. Um, now, if we look back on the Embraer side, they kind of share the same problem still, and, and, and Embraer really hasn't you know, found a good solution. The, the E175 E2 is, is not compliant with scope, uh, their solution for now is to continue to build the E175 E1, which is compliant uh, and uh, actually sells quite well and has been selling quite well for, for a number of years. But obviously at some point uh, Embraer will have to make a call yeah. of, uh, on how to deal with, uh, with scope if it doesn't change. Right, and of course the E175 E2, the first version of it, is actually still being built anyway. Uh, they're going to go ahead with the, the test program, basically run through the entire development as if it was ready for prime time. And of course, it will make it ready for prime time in the event that the market actually does change for it. But in the meantime, of course, Mitsubishi makes what is really rather a gutsy move, I think, to, to change course with, with the M100. Uh, I thought it was very interesting in that one of the things they've done to maintain that weight and keep it within the bounds of scope clause, uh, while at the same time stretching it internally, was is to reduce the wingspan, uh, again by about four feet overall. And it just, by and by, just works out that if you bring in if you bring this in a little bit, you can just shave enough weight off and you can reduce it so that it keeps in that nice tight bundle, really. So probably in a couple of years, um, I think we're going to be seeing more, more new jets on the flight line. I mean, this one is coming. Uh, I, mean, I, ho I mean, hopefully the, the max crisis will, will be, will be uh, solved soon. Um, and who knows, uh, like, uh, you know, not, not the next Paris and maybe not the, you know, the one after that, but then we might see a lot of new uh, uh, versions of current aircraft and possibly soon, uh, soon after that, the NMA, right? Yes, no, you're right, Jens. That'll, that's going to be something interesting to look forward to uh, future air shows. Plenty to keep us writing, that's for certain. Sure. So uh, anyway, thanks very much for your thoughts. Thank you.